And one of the, the issues right now is there are a lot of people very worried about the future of our nation, the society, and a lot of other things, mm -hmm. and with due course. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot to be worried about. But my starting point in that broader frame is saying the first thing we need to do is believe that it is possible that we can have a better future. Hi, I'm Ross Dawson, a futurist and entrepreneur and the author of Thriving on Overload. Today, I'm on Everford Radio talking about how to create a better future for ourselves and others and how to prosper in a world of unlimited information. Mr. Dawson, welcome to the show. Fantastic to be with you, Chase. Thank you so much. Um, I was sharing with you that your scope of practice, your expertise is something that's pretty new to me. Um, I don't think it's new, but new to me. And that's futurism. What does that mean? Define that for us, please. And also introduce yourself as well, please. So, so I'm Ross Dawson. Mm. I'm a futurist uh, entrepreneur. Mm. So do lots of different things. But for me, the thing about thinking about the future, there's lots of approaches to thinking about the future. We can't know what the future will bring, mm. but we do have lots of clues. We have lots of information. We have ideas around what is happening, trends, which uncertainties. We can think about the use the future in a useful way. Mm. So that's the, the heart of it, saying how can we think about the future in a way that means that we can make better decisions which are more likely to create a future that we want. So this is not about predicting the future. We mm. can't predict the future because it's created by all sorts of crazy people and sane people all just working <laughs> together and doing things and unpredictable things. Yeah. But what we can do is we can see the trends. We can think about the uncertainties. There's a lot of structured ways to think about it. And the key thing which comes out of that is saying, mm. what decisions do we make today to create a future which I am want to live in? What decisions do we make today that makes a future that I want to live in? Yes. Or I, others, or, the, or humanity yeah. at large, whatever it is, or whatever our scope is, saying, what future do you want? Mm. And then you say, well, what's happening? And in a way, you're looking for those turning points. What yeah. are the points where you can say, well, this is taking this action or saying these things? Well, things are more likely to shift us towards a world which I mm. want to live in or I, I think that we should be living in. At its core, what I kind of hear there is um, the ability to take away or reduce a lot of anxiety and uncertainty about what could happen in our world, in the world. But then even more, it's every choice has consequences. Absolutely. But the thing is, we need to want well, today more than ever. We have to be comfortable with ambiguity. We have to be comfortable mm. with uncertainty. We can't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So being anxious about the future is not helpful. But what we can do is to understand that there are forks in the world and the road which mm. are leading forward, and that some of the things we can do are likely to shape that. And this is the world at large. So we can think about it in terms of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What are the trends? What are the things which I new opportunities which are emerging where I can start a business and create value for myself and other people. That's one of the things which we look into the future for. It's for your own life, for your family, for mm -hmm. your community, for your organization, for your nation, for all of humanity. All, all the, of the above. Other. Yeah. yeah, and saying, so these are the things which we need to be thinking about we, mm. which, as that role of futurism mm. is to say, how can we think usefully about the future mm. so that we are more likely to create a future that we want than ones that we don't want. Let's kind of reel it in to the most useful daily application of this. The uh, air quote here, average person listening. Maybe they're not an entrepreneur. Maybe they're not super gung ho driven. You know, they're just, they're there. And I'm not saying this in, in any kind of negative light, but just the average American will say, um, if they take hold of this concept of, okay, the future is ambiguous, but I'm not going to let that kind of get me anxious and worried, but rather I'm going to choose to kind of have a little bit of power over it. Um, there's great opportunity in there. So if we're starting kind of like this baseline position, but upset, ac accepting this as truth, what does that really mean for us? What, what are actionable next steps we can take? Well, one of, one of the most important things is thinking about the future of work. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we're all so, working in some way. Absolutely. Well, that's yeah. the, that's our work today, our work tomorrow, that of our children, mm. that of our, of the media community saying, well, the, the reality is work has changed tremendously and is changing faster and faster. Mm. So amongst other things, we've got 
getting over 5 billion people around the world who are all connected. And then when remote work happens, these are it's all people. people who can uh, do all kinds of work and automation. More and more AI is coming. So I am a firm believer that we will, or we certainly have the opportunity to create a world where we all are not only employed mm. and uh, profitably, but we are doing things which are more and more tapping our greatest talents. But that's one of the things where we have to shape that future of work. Mm. But we do need to be thinking, what's going to happen with my job? Will aspects of that be automated? What are the mm. skills I need to develop? What are the competences? What are the things which I need to instill in my children to be able to create that? So for anybody and everybody, your job will be different in 10 years from now. Guaranteed. 10, ten months from now, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a very... You know, it's more than just practical. It's yeah. just like the things. These are the things we have to be thinking about mm. in order to be able to create a better future for ourselves. And specifically when it comes to our employment, um, is it really thinking of, all right, let me just try to put myself, wrap my head around the concept of endless opportunity? Or do I really need to get super clear as to what I think my future work self is going to look like and then operate out of that version? Like I think in 10 years my employed self, my worker self is going to have these responsibilities, have this salary, have this lifestyle, and then acting in that way? Or is it just accepting the ambiguity and just kind of going along for the ride? Both. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so, Not going to make it easy. I don't so, know. so in my book, Thriving on Overload, it starts with purpose. Mm. And you know, the purpose is, you know, very few people say, this is my purpose in life. I know what, why I'm here on earth. But we can sort of say, this is the sorts of things which, why I think I might have it be Very as my true. purpose. Yeah, so just yeah. trying to think, well, just as a placeholder, all right, well, this might be why I was here. I might be wrong, but at least this is a placeholder. This could get me a little bit closer yeah. to it. Yeah, and so it's just like saying, okay, rather than sort of giving up, so, you know, there's a few very lucky people who say, I know what my purpose is. Yeah. Most of us are sort of in that journey yeah. and it is a journey because it changes. You know, what you feel your purpose is now may be different over the years. So you get some kind of an idea of that. And then you're saying, these are the characteristics of my life. Yes. And that's yeah. the process which I went through. Mm. Uh, when I was left, I said, okay, I've had enough of being employed. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do my own thing. I actually don't know what I'm going to do specifically, <laughs> but these are the characteristics of my yeah. life. You know, and then I said, okay, these are all these characteristics. These are the order of priority. Let's stack up the mm. different things I could do and how those align and be able to fill those characteristics where I want to travel. Mm. I want to be working with all kinds of amazing people. I want to be able to take time off when I want to. You know, these are some of the characteristics. Oh, this is the contribution I want to make. Mm. And so these are the things which, we, you know, it's hopefully we can take some time off occasionally just to think mm -hmm. deeply about these things. These are things we're thinking about over time. And this evolves over time. No, and I think this idea of this is where I'm going to be in 10 years and I'm set on that. Mm. is pretty dangerous because on the road, you're going to be different. The world's going to of be course. different. And so there is both of that thing where, yes, you're getting an idea of where you're going. You're getting a directionality in your life, but you're also being open to discovering yourself. Mm. And again, what I write about in Thriving on Overload is this idea of you get an idea of your purpose in order to look at what information's out there, what uh, ideas there are, what opportunities you can see. And that starts to inform you by inspiring you. Mm. You are looking mm -hmm. for what is most inspiring. Say, ah, that inspires me. That tells me something about myself, about what drives me, yeah. about what my purpose is, around what it is I really want to do. So you get this virtuous cycle mm. of using whatever idea you have about yourself and your directions and where you want to go to finding the information and the insights and mm. the amazing people and the uh, you know, adventures and uh, progress and technologies. The life. And, and then the that's life, what feeds yeah. you back saying, okay, that helps me to then mm -hmm. you know, be more refined, more mm -hmm. specific around what it is that I, who I am and what I'm looking to achieve. You know, you hit on something really important there that I, I think uh, kind of pun intended people miss um, miss along the way and might have even missed in what you just said. And that's along the way to finding our purpose, um, paying attention to these little cues, paying attention to these things that might be, oh, this is where you need to kind of pivot, or this is what you need to leave behind and take with you onto the next thing. I've been there and I, I'm be willing to bet you have as well. We embark on a path on an, an employee entrepreneurship or a job career. And we think that's it. I went to school for this. Everybody expects me to be this. I'm very good at this. And so we just stay on that path. But things along that path, things along that way are like, no, 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 no. Like you're meant to start here, but then go 
You're supposed to zig. You're supposed to zag. You're supposed to maybe take this and leave it and go create your own. But why do we stay so focused on the path before us being the only path? And why do we miss these other things that are like, no, 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 this was a stepping stone to your purpose. So in Thriving on Overload, I talk about attention. And mm. attention is something that's getting ripped away from us at all times. That is the economy. It's a attention hijacking economy. Okay. There's billions of dollars going into taking our attention away from us. And that's all very much in the present. We are being pulled closer into the present. As the world goes faster and faster, mm. we're just sort of thinking about what we are seeing, what's happening today. Yeah. And our, one of the things is breadth of attention. Mm. We are being pulled into very tight focus. Our screens, <laughs> our smartphones in front of us. And that's what's dragging our attention. Yeah. And so it's all just pulling in us into this immediate, what's happening today? What's the latest What's celebrity here, news? what's now, yeah. And so when we are broadening our attention, part of it is broadening our attention in terms of time frames. Mm. Let's think about one year, three years, five years, seven years. Let's think about you know, geography. And there's actually a lot of research which has shown that getting into these broader states of mind, thinking about Places that are distant. Think about Rome. Mm. If you think about Rome for a while, you'll oh, be I love starting thinking to about Rome. <laughs> thinking about it. You'll be think, you will be literally yeah. broadening your perspectives. There is this wonderful practice, which is breadth of attention, where you are paying attention to a peripheral vision. So if you're just you're looking at mm -hmm. yourself right now, we're keeping your eyes straight ahead, pay attention to what's on the right and what's on the left. Uh -huh. And this is actually a very powerful practice. This is one that not only... Is brings us into a state of you know, quasi meditative state. Mm. It actually changes the, our brain waves and it literally expands our perspectives. And so this literally. is a wonderful practice. Just standing, waiting mm. across the road, or just at home, just expand your attention to your peripheral vision. Mm. And this is a practice which literally is broadening your scope of attention. So we are mm. pulled away. We, our society is making us more and more focused. We need to be pushing our attention broader. I, I'm l trying to quite literally imagine that in the application of our careers, of what we're doing, and more specifically how we're doing it. And so I'm just thinking, all right, I'm going to think a year down the road, 10 years down the road of this version of myself that I think is going to be working how I'm going to be working. But instead of staying so focused on that, that identity, that version, that day in the life, it's kind of tricky. It's, not, it's kind of weird. But like, if we did that, like what you just said, stay focused on our goal, but keep our periphery, periphery that's a word, peripheries open. Like, what environment is that in? What are all these other contributing factors, you know? Well, so, so that's, you know, coming back to your earlier yeah, question, yeah. as we are living our lives, mm. that's the danger of the goal. You set your the light on the goal, the goal. Wow. and you're not looking to the sides and you're not seeing these other things which are going on in the world or yourself or how you're evolving. Yeah. And so I, you know, the Plato said that the, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm. And so I've always lived by the precept. So by, I've lived my life by examining myself all the time, saying, what on earth am I doing with my life every single day of my life? And so I... Yeah, I haven't had a midlife crisis because I've been in an internal crisis. <laughs> you know, I'm always saying, what, what, the, like F the, what the F I am I doing I with stay, my life? I stay in fear. I stay, <laughs> so stay mad. Yeah, yeah forced, to, forced to look out. And uh, that's wow. what happens to people is they get stuck mm. in a channel. They're continuing to live their lives. They're yeah. not looking inside. They're looking to the peripheries of what could be and mm. what might be. And so this is, again, attention. It's something we do need to focus. We do need to say, okay. This is my enterprise. Right, I, see yeah. the, I see the goal. I see the objective. I'm excited about this. And you have to be focused for a while around that. But it's, there's this balance. And that's one of mm -hmm. the great tensions. You know, so in Thriving on Overload, this idea of how do we prosper in a world of mm -hmm. unlimited information with unlimited everything, we are overwhelmed at all times. One of the key tensions is mm -hmm. this narrow and broad. Mm -hmm. We need to be deeply focused at times, but we also must open out our attention to breadth. And that's, that cycle of open wow. and breadth in, in our attention is what brings us the richness Ooh, that we yeah, can bring yeah. to life. Um, I'm sure you go deeper into, into this in your book, but is there a, like a time frame for that? Is it like a practice of, all right, X amount of days, I need to be laser focused. Other amount of days, I need to be have the breadth focus. Or is it just 
kind of finding that rhythm day to day? It's, it's within each day. Okay. Within each day, we do need times of focus. So, so one of the things is that, you know, as an absolute minimum, everybody should have 90 minutes every week where they have zero distractions. Like white space on the calendar. Just yes. Well, it's, no, it's, well, it's blocked out. It's blocked out. For, Block off nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and so obviously all your digital notifications mm -hmm. are off, all your alerts. You tell everybody not to disturb you unless it's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you make sure that you have space, uh, you're comfortable, and you've dedicated yourself to one thing. Could be thinking about the future. Could be writing something. It could mm -hmm. be uh, developing some ideas. It just could be some deep reading. Whatever it is, there is this time when you are completely focused. Mm -hmm. And you do not have any distraction. This is training, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm saying 90 minutes a week is an absolute minimum. But that's again, that's 75 hours a, a year wow. where you can be doing something incredibly focused. You can get started on your. Book. Can this you be can in like micro something. sections, or like you're saying one 90 minute block? It has to be the 90 minute section because the, there okay. is what is called the basic rest activity cycle, which is basically uh, the 90 minutes has been shown to be the cycle of our attention. Mm. And so 90 minutes is a great time to be able to carve out. And you you would, within 45 minutes, you'd take five minute break. Yeah. But that is part of the, the practice of developing focus. And I'm saying that 90 minutes once a week is the absolute minimum. I think anybody can do that and you'll find incredible value from it, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But you, then you can, for some people, they should be doing that every day if they do have a project, as in, you know, create a mm -hmm. project or trying to define their lives or skill development, whatever it may be. But there is that practice of being deeply focused and developing mm. your capacity for focus with no distractions. Wow. And that's what our world has given us so much distractions and so much propensity to be distracted that we do need to train ourselves. We need to get back to this time mm. when 90 minutes without distractions is entirely normal. We're able to do that. But each day as well, we need to be thinking broad. Mm. And that's not just sort of you know being distracted by all of the wells, but just literally let's get into a broad, expansive state. Mm. Let's think outwards. Let looks for information or ideas which I would never normally discover because I'm going to oh, create yeah, the, yeah, the, true. the you know to create serendipity by exploring in different uh -huh. ways to find things. These are the practices mm. which we can bring into our lives. Do you, being the futurist that you are, um, it, I mean, already I've been learning so many ways to kind of take more control over my future while still kind of being in surrender to the ambiguity of it all, um, if that makes any sense. Um, but do you worry, do you wonder, do you have any predictions about how the world is going to evolve and grow even more so that we might even have to fight even more for our attention, stay laser focused and have breadth? Like, is the landscape, is the environment gonna change drastically? How and when? So there's some things we can know about the future. One is that AI will get better. Another is that they're going to get mm. better at hijacking our attention. Yeah, uh, and, weapons of mass attraction, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The other is, you know, some more obvious ones, our population mm. is going to increase. It. And so these are the some things we can understand as inevitable. Yeah, so it is going to get harder and harder to maintain control of mm. our attention, our ability to live our own, to have think for ourselves. And we can literally. probably know this by looking at the past, right? The way that technology and the economy and everybody has grown in the last five, 10 years, we can probably just count on that replicating, right? Yeah, well, okay. so one of, one of the key dynamics here is simply the application of AI to mm. hijacking our attention. Mm. So the more data they have, getting more and more data, they're more able to sort of understand what it is that uh, grabs our attention. I believe it, they, yeah, yeah. And so that's down very much personalized. So. In the not too long distant future, there's going to be some personalized yeah. uh, people trying to hijack your attention in order to sell you things or whatever it is they want. And if the listener wants to, sorry to interrupt you again, but if like what you're talking about reminds me of an episode I think we had like two years ago with Near I All, uh, Indistractable. Yeah, great. Um, phenomenal book. I'll link it down in the show notes for everybody and his episode. I mean, what you're just talking about is what we talked about for an hour. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So so Near's book is Great, yeah, yeah, indistractable. Yeah. And, you know, and there's some very tactical things around how it is you can control mm -hmm. your attention in a world where it's being hijacked mm -hmm. all the time. But that's one thing which we can know for sure is that the choice, well, I, I think, believe it is fundamental. Either we can let mm -hmm. our attention be controlled by all the people that are trying to uh, control it. I like that choice of words. Or we can choose to take control of our own attention, but that is not something which we's, is, comes easily. Mm. 
We're, we're combating companies with billions of dollars of research budgets and working on how to take our attention from us. We have to expect to work to control our attention, uh, what the information that we take in so that we shape who we are. The information that we take in shapes us. That is who we are mm. in a world awashed with information. And we have to be very selective around what it is we choose mm -hmm. to really become part of us through our consumption of uh, information. I'm curious, what, what, are, what are your habits? What are your tactics? Uh, I'm sure you practice what you preach here, but what, what does like a day in the life look like for you and kind of staying laser focused and staying focused on the breadth of everything here while also being mindful of all this potential and ambiguity in the future, like habits, tactics, what does it look like? You know, I know this is you, but you know, what does that look like? Well, we'll just take a few, a few things. Yeah. One, one is where possible when I wake up, I don't try to check email and mm. news, go to a really, a book, which mm. will, you know, where I'm reading over time and I'm just sort of able to think out to broader thoughts. And so there's, you know, getting engaged my thinking rather than just get pulled into the latest horrific thing, which is happening. Yeah, which is instead of getting sucked into that laser thing yep. that they want you to focus on, you're starting by focusing on the breath. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and what you want to focus on. Yeah, that's that's one step. Uh, okay. Another thing is for me, and so, so we all have different uh, cycles of uh, through the day of when we have the most focus and attention. Mm -hmm. For me, 10 to 1 is a fantastic time. So I'll read a book, get up, have coffee, uh, have usually have a meeting in the morning mm. just because of time zones with people I'm speaking with and so on. So thriving on overload is not really about thinking about the future. It is how do we deal with the world of excessive information mm. and create value from it? Because that's something we all deal with. I originally had this idea of writing a book about the future. My agent said it would be better to write a book around one of the chapter. The people can't titles. handle the future. They can't handle <laughs> it all. Well, there's a lot of books about the future, but really the pragmatic piece is how do we take in information, make sense mm -hmm. of that to be able to live better? And this concept of thriving on overload, which mm -hmm. is something I've actually been literally thinking about and writing about for 25 years now, mm -hmm. is this essence of something which is relevant to everybody and how it is we can live in a world with more and more information than ever before to be able to create something of great value from that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things which is a real essence of that is this idea of synthesis, mm. where synthesis is pulling things together. We're all taught to analyze. Anybody that goes to college or university gets taught to analyze things. You slice things into smaller and smaller pieces. But that is something that computers are good at. That is kind of like a real functional thing. And the part of this idea of focus and breadth, part of the focus is slicing things down. The breadth is how does this fit together? How do I synthesize all of the pieces that this that I'm seeing in the world together to make sense of that? What, what's the meaning this of whole? it all? Yeah. Yes. This this idea of this idea of the whole, the system, mm. you know, the world we live in, and from which you can most easily see those opportunities. So from when I was young, I was always fascinated with this idea of synthesis, this pulling mm. together of the ideas. And again, this is a frame of mind. Mm. It's the frame mm. moving away from, okay, I'm gonna do all this analysis and chunk, do all these numbers and you know break things in all these little pieces and that's what all the management consultants do. Yeah, yeah. But you know, whereas what we need to be doing in a more and more complex world is synthesis, mm. and that's the final, the fifth of the five powers of thriving and overload is synthesis, mm. and that's something which I believe in a fast changing world, more and more complex, more and more chaotic. That's what we need to be able to tap is our ability to synthesize ideas, to open our minds to how things are connected. That is the fundamental human capability and is the one that will keep us ahead of AI for as long as we can imagine. Wow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so then I have to ask, and we might have already touched on some of the others, but if that's the fifth one, what are the other four? So the first one is purpose, mm -hmm. knowing why. Why do you want to engage with information at all? The second one is framing, being able to build a framework of all of the information you're seeing, mm -hmm. how that fits together into building the structure, these mental models, this understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. The third one is filtering, to be able to use all of what you understand, to be able to 
to process discern. and compartmentalize yeah, your discern. But also to discern what, what is yeah. useful to you, what adds value to your life as opposed to what subtracts value from your life. Huge, huge, <laughs> and yeah. So the getting that sense, that being able to get that subtle discernment to be able to say, okay, that's good, that's bad, mm. and building those channels, the information you take in. The fourth is attention, mm. being able to say, well, attention is not just one thing. What are the different types of attention? When should I have those at different types of day? Mm -hmm. How can I develop my capabilities for attention? And finally, synthesis, where you're pulling that all together into that, that understanding of the whole and the ability to make better decisions for your life, for your company, mm. for your, you know, your community and beyond. It's when the big picture really comes together. Exactly. Um, I'd like to dive deeper into the discernment section, if we could, please. That one, for me personally, struck a chord because I think I'll say that is probably the most important to me. Um, and I would argue for a lot of people is there are a lot of ways that we can learn. We can have laser focus, like we said, we can have breath, but just like, why is it important, you know, and how can I find meaning out of it? But aside from my meaning, discernment in the things that we're choosing to spend our time and put our attention on. I think is huge. So crack that open for us, please. Part of it is coming back in tune with yourself. This comes mm. back to purpose and knowing yourself and what it is you're wanting to achieve. And this is a part, a process of developing more that sensitivity or that capability mm. of being able to gauge what it is that serves you, what it is that doesn't serve you. Most information in a world of information Almost all information has negative value. Mm. Not zero value, but negative value. As in like it takes away. Exactly. Okay. If it takes your time without giving you lots mm. of value, it's detracting for you, Al. If it's misinformation, if it's disinformation, if like it's this, misleading. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking all the scroll, away, taking away. That, that yeah. is taking away <laughs> value from yourself. So this, on the other side, there is certainly a world of information out there of insights, of ideas, of uh, all sorts of things, including your show, of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> which which uh, add value to mm. your life. And so the, a part of it is simply being conscious. Every time you are making a mm. choice, do I read this? Do I scroll this? Yeah. Do I watch this? Do being, I listen to this? Being present in the action we're choosing to spend our time exactly. on. Yeah. And so you, you are consciously making a choice. Is this a way I want to spend my time and attention? My so precious attention, my limited attention. This is all I've got in my life. Do I want to spend it on this or not? Mm -hmm. And so this is something where we, but this is part of attention. This is part of awareness. This is through our day. We need to be mm -hmm. conscious of the choices we make. Is this actually making me better? Is this making me happier? Is this going to serve my objectives yeah. and purpose? And so being conscious of that. And it's actually you know, and something which isn't that hard, but it helps you become more in tune yourself because mm. you are checking in with yourself at every time. You Is have to, right? if you're choosing this, you have to check in with yourself, yeah. Exactly, it's and it's checking in with yourself byproduct. starts to refine your understanding of who mm. you are. Yes, this is something... Or, or maybe, okay, this is a guilty pleasure. Yeah, All right, but a celebrity yeah. use. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Five minutes, whatever. <laughs> but, Very fair. Very fair. <laughs> I love how you kind of uh, angled that um, of taking away value uh, first before really getting clear on what value is it giving me. And I love that kind of that shift. Uh, I think a lot of us might struggle with that of, well, is this book going to give me value? Is scrolling going to give me value? Is spending time on this podcast you know, the person listening is giving us their most valuable resource right now. Exactly. Their time. And I think if we choose the opposite first of, is this going to take away, is this going to reduce value? It might be more helpful to help us figure out the things that are gonna really gonna add value to our life. I, I think a lot of us would be more off the cuff, easier uh, to say, oh yeah, for sure, that's gonna be a waste of my time versus like that one, I don't know, but I also don't think it's going to take away value. You sure. Know? Yeah. Um, but also, you, you mentioned purpose a lot, and I think that was even your first point of the five. Are all the others obtainable if we first don't have purpose, or can we understand or even wrap our head around the other four steps if we don't first have purpose? It's Purpose is the starting point, mm. but it doesn't mean that we need to know our life's purpose. Part of it is saying, what is relationship with information do you want relationship i like that yeah and so just as we have a relationship with money mm. we have a relationship with food 
We also have a relationship with information, and that can be a positive or a negative relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, a destructive one, where it's abusive relationship mm -hmm. with information. They, we abuse information, it abuses us. Truly, or yeah. it can be an enabling yeah. Yeah. Uh, relationship. So one of the relationships is in terms of your expertise. All of us need to be thinking, what do I want to become an expert in? What, what do I really want to know a lot about? What do I want to be known for? Yes. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that's another uh, way to frame that. And mm -hmm. having some, again, you don't need to know exactly what it is, but some sort of clarity. All right. This is part of my path in mm -hmm. order to do that. This is the information which will, the relationship with information which will serve me developing my expertise, my, mm -hmm. my uniqueness. Another is in terms of your ventures, whatever they may be, you know, mm -hmm. from a community garden through to a startup. Another is your relationship with information with health. And that's an important relationship to have. What sort of information serves me? And mm. so just thinking through things such as your, uh, your well-being, your expertise, your ventures, and just also just uh, looking at your passions. Mm. All right, this is something which is not going to make me a living, but I just love Brings this. Brings me joy, yes. which is very important to have in life. Yeah. Exactly. And so again, that, what's your relationship? So just even thinking about these things, it doesn't mean you have this master purpose, mm. but these are things which, you know, just thinking through those things gives you a lot of clarity around what it is that serves you and what doesn't as you expose to a universe of information. Which do you think has the most potential for keeping us on track and for derailing us. Um, what the future holds for ourselves and what we're, the future we're building for ourselves compared to the future of our environment, the future of the world. Because uh, I kind of feel like we can be taking all these things you're talking about and applying them and really be building a great future, or at least putting ourselves on the path to that. But like we've talked about, the world, like they don't care about us. The world's gonna change and grow and do all that stuff. So is it, do we need to kind of have like 50-50 awareness of these two things or should I focus more on building my future self and then that I'm better in the future world or should I try to wrap my head around more of what I think the future world is gonna look like and then just hopefully I'll kind of fit the mold? I think it's a personal choice mm. where the degree, a lot of my personal focus is on the world at large. And this, but I, I wouldn't advocate saying everybody, that should be the choice for everybody. Gotcha, yeah. And one of the, the issues right now is there are a lot of people very worried about the future of our nation, the society, and a lot of other things, mm -hmm. and with due course. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot to be worried about. But my starting point in that broader frame is saying the first thing we need to do is believe that it is possible that mm -hmm. we can have a better future. And if we don't believe yeah. it's possible, yeah. that's not good. You might check out now. But Ooh, if yeah. you do believe it's possible, even if it's at like 0.001% of a chance that we can have a better future for all of us, for humanity and beyond, mm -hmm. then we should be doing whatever mm -hmm. we can in order to be able to maximize that opportunity. So yes, I believe absolutely and family, and mm. I'll have a big argument with anybody that does, <laughs> that yes, there is a chance. Yeah. And we can argue about how big that chance is, but yes, we can create a better future. And so, and all of us can think, all right, well, what tiny things can I do which will contribute towards that? Mm. And that is part of that purpose, that is part of that living that life. I think, I think it's fair. I mean, again, everyone has their own choice, but mm. I think it's fair that all of our purposes should include that the world is better after we mm -hmm. live than uh, without us. So tiny in tiny ways, massive ways, whatever it may be. But I think we can all think about, well, yes, I can see how it could be possible there is a better future, mm -hmm. and these are some of the things which I can do which lead towards that. And I think you start to see your place in oh, that better yeah, future yeah, as you start yeah. to think about that and say, well, yeah. these are, this is what, who I will be. Mm -hmm. This is what I will be doing. Let's, this is the world in which I want to nudge towards mm -hmm. that, uh, that better you know, shape. And this is what I'll be doing in that world, mm. partly for me, but also as partly contributing to that future. You came in uh, with your two amazing daughters. And I'm um, curious, what influence has being a father had, had on you in terms of your futurist self? It's, it just underlines the promise and potential. You know, mm. My daughters were born in this uh, millennium 
Uh, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it just seems quite extraordinary to, you know, been born so recently mm. into this amazing world. And it's, of course, whatever you're born into mm. just seems the most natural thing in the world. But they are, and I think all the other young people I know, are believers in doing things to create a better future. I'm seeing so much of that. Good. In younger yeah. people of, of their desire and willingness. I mean, we've seen that through, you know, three generations. But I, I believe more than ever today. And I think that's just one of the most wonderful things we can look to. And I have great issue with people who think that it's not good to have children today because there are a lot of worrying things because our children are the ones who are going to solve those problems and yeah. to see that potential and to do the things which you're going to create. And haven't we said this future. like every generation? Is that, I don't want to bring children into the world that has these problems. But the, the world's problems aren't going any, anywhere. They're just changing. Yes, yes. And I, and I, I am, well, I'm an optimist. We're not saying that the mm. things will get better. I am a deep optimist and that things could have the chance mm. to become enormously better. And I can think I can see the sorts of things that we could be doing. And I think we all understand mm. what they are, which will create a extraordinarily mm -hmm. better future, one with potential to unleash who we are, who we can be as individuals, as a society. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. You know, also being who you are, uh, coming from a different walk of life, you live from another continent, a uh, different country. Uh, I'm curious now, because I have to assume there's a little bit of bias maybe for us, where we were born, where we're raised, the country, the religion, the household, all these things, the government, um, the environment, uh, quite literally the weather, um, influences and has probably a passive or an active uh, way we view the future, or even think to choose to think about the future. Um, what's it like? where you're from. I'm curious, you're a well-traveled man. Um, or do you see like geography playing a major role into these concepts? Absolutely. So I was, I live in Sydney, Australia. Mm. I've lived in, well, four continents. Wow. Wow. Um, in, you know, various guises. So, and yeah, I've mm. traveled a lot, lived a lot of places. And in uh, Asia and Africa mm. are both, extraordinary continents of the future with mm. extraordinary different cultures and ways of thinking. And uh, so we can't be too focused on the geography of where yeah. we are. Yeah, yeah. We do need to be looking beyond. We all are interrelated and obviously a universe of ways. And so I think we do need to be understanding what is happening in Asia. And Asia is incredibly diverse. Mm. So we can't just say in Asia was one thing. Asia is a whole multitude of countries and cultures and ways of thinking. Uh, the most massive continent we got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly in population. A lot of people, a lot of walks of life, a lot of and, everything. Uh, and Africa is the only growing mm. uh, continent in terms of population. So almost essentially all the uh, population growth over the next decades is going to be in Africa. Really? So extraordinary, well. yeah, extraordinary dynamic. So uh, so they're quite literally the future yes. of this planet. Yes. At least here now, 2022. So this is, these are the, and again, different cultures, different ways wow. of thinking, different ways of seeing. And so, and again, coming back to that focus or breadth, yeah. we do need to be thinking more broadly because mm. our future will be more and more interrelated in mm. a multitude of ways. And that is an extraordinary opportunity to be able to take the best of these talent, of the ideas, of the energy. I was on my, my podcast, I was speaking to this woman who is helping foster futurist thinking in rural South Africa. And There we go. And so these are people that might have to share a digital device among the classroom, mm. but giving them this, helping them to think about the promise and potential of the future. Mm. And... These are what well, the ideas they come up with is extraordinary. What if to kind of go from geography to maybe a, a, quite literally a state where we are to a state of being, 
what if we are, I feel like a lot of what we've been talking about has been the person who's ready. I'm more of like a clean slate. I want to choose optimism. I want to choose to laser focus. I want to choose to build and imagine my future. What if maybe the person listening is really set in their ways? Like maybe in no harm, no harm, no foul to them, but it's just like, I've been building my career. I've been building my life. I'm already this far down the line. There's no way my future is going to be any different. Is there a way to kind of undo that train of thought? And I mean, because until quite literally you die, right? Your future still exists. Exactly right. So in the book, the chapter on synthesis Mm. in Thriving on Overload, I talk about uh, active open-minded thinking. Mm. So there... Research has shown us that there are five fundamental personality dimensions, uh, openness, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, introversion, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Mm. And so those are the five. But Quite one, the dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the most important is this openness to experience. Mm. And this is, in the past, we have thought is this is a basic personality trait. It doesn't change much over time. But more and more research is showing that we can actually change our personality. We Mm. can choose to be more open. And there's a whole set of different activities and practices, uh, you know, including just exposure to culture or just being able to make choices to push yourself forward, which can make you more open to Mm. experience, to new ideas, to new possibilities. So again, this is a choice. And if people don't want to, Mm -hmm. then that's a choice. But in fact... Not only is this open to us to experience personality associated with more likely to do a venture or a startup, be yeah. more successful in that venture, more likely to be promoted, more likely to be happy. There's a, there's a lot of uh, less likely to get Alzheimer's. There's, yeah, a, there's yeah. just so many benefits. All good things. Yeah. <laughs> which, are, which mean that it is something which we can choose mm. to work on and develop as to who we are and to try to choose to take on new possibilities, Mm. to open our vistas, to be broader. Mm. And so this isn't choice. And again, this comes back to this idea of all of this is a choice. We can close ourselves off from the world Mm. or we can open ourselves up. Mm. And the faster the world changes, the more being open is an advantage. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to, that's a clip right there. I'm going to use that for sure. Um, as we're going to get to the end, this conversation has been so fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm always curious, again, as someone who has written the book on it, after you were done with this, what was left? Was there one thing that just is like, oh, I wish I could have fit this in or, you know, kind of like all your work led you to this new realization or like what's on the horizon after what we've already talked about? So, so in the final chapter of the book, after I've covered the five powers, there is a summing up chapter. And I talk about this idea of cognitive evolution, Mm. how it is our thinking evolves. And that's really where, you know, my my work is going from here, is saying as individuals, and and by extension, in a way, as the human race, Mm. how can we evolve our thinking? How can Mm. we evolve our ability to think better, to function in a world which is faster paced than anything in human history? Yeah. Because the default impact of the world today is that it makes us dumber. (laughs) Yeah. And so if we just sort of sit here in our normal world today, we pick up our phones and we watch the ads and we win ourselves, we are being made more stupid. And Because life is being made more easy, right? And when things get easier, we stop showing up as much, right? Yep, 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 absolutely right. And so, but we do have that choice to say, all right, I am not going to go that default path of, you know, where all of the Mm -hmm. advertisers and corporations want my attention to go, I actually choose not only to claim my own attention, but to evolve my ability to think better, to, you know, be able to take in more things, to be able to make better decisions, to be able to live in a world which is incredibly fast moving, incredibly, you know, amazing things happening all the time, difficult to grasp, but ones which as humans we have created and we can create and use and apply to be able to create better lives for ourselves and others. So this is literally about our evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Creating better lives for ourselves and others is what I'm all about and is exactly what I mean here on the show when I say living a life ever forward. But I'm curious, 
Ross, what does that mean to you when you hear those two words? How do you live a life ever forward? There's this uh, concept in economics called sunk costs. Mm. And that is where you've invested something, and that's sunk, that's gone. That's history, that's the past. It doesn't matter what you've spent in the past. Mm. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You are only ever in the present moving forward. Mm. The only decisions you can make are ones which affect your future. The past mm -hmm. is... Irrelevant. You've made a made, maybe you made some great decisions. It's maybe done. You, it's maybe, done. Yeah, maybe you made some terrible decisions. Maybe some good things happened. Maybe some bad things happened. It doesn't matter. The only thing you can do mm. is to move forward, to imagine what you want to create, and to take the steps to create it. So I absolutely, fully on board with that thesis. Ever forward. That's the only thing you can do. Yes. Um, to kind of like piggyback off of what you just said there. Uh, I love that explanation and interpretation. Thank you. Um, no matter what happened in our past, good, bad, ugly, sexy, ugly, you know, ugly again, um, yeah, it's done. Everything is done, whether it was a failure or success. Um, but everything there in the past is a teacher for us to then incorporate a lot of these concepts you've been talking about to choose potential for the future. Um, we're all starting at the same point right here, right now, the present day but we all have a unique tools in our box of everything that led us up to this point. Um, but the choice is ours, right? The choice you is bet. ours for tomorrow. You bet. Uh, well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm going to have your work uh, in the book, Thriving on Overload, down on the show notes and video notes for everybody. Check this one out. Um, this was such a cool concept for me to dive into because like I said, you know, futurism uh, is a new term, new kind of everything for me. Um, but just the way that you presented it was like, oh yeah, Oh yeah. <laughs> like I'm familiar, but I'm going to learn something new at the same time. It's great. Um, well, besides the book, like I said, where can everybody go to learn more about you and your work? Where are you hanging out the most online? So thriving on overload.com. Okay. It's got not just the book, but also an online course, podcast, a bunch of resources. Uh, for me, it's just rossdawson.com or on Twitter at Ross Dawson or LinkedIn. Too easy. Too I'm easy. easy to find. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have all that link for you guys down below. Um, thank you so much. This was great. I thank really you. enjoyed it.